Friends, welcome back to the Wild at Heart podcast. John and Blaine here in the studio wrapping up the final episode in the series that we've been doing. And here's the problem, is that we're recording this on September 3rd, uh, because that was our studio slot, but this is going to air sometime in October. And the difficult thing about a world like this is we don't, we don't know what the world's going to be like then. We can make some guesses, though. I think it's safe to say that the world's not going to be suddenly awesome then. That feels, <laughs> that feels fair. Well, like here in Colorado, you know, yes, they did open the universities up, but they've got dorms, full dorms, in total lockdown now because, you know, COVID's ramping up there and India just saw its largest surge since the highest days of the pandemic back in the spring. And, you you know, we're trying to make plans to get overseas to do some mission things for the ministry and for the events we want to do. Countries are still locked. We're trying to get some film projects done. We can't get there to film. And then add to that, oh, gosh, the U.S. presidential race. So it's just hard to speak into an environment that six weeks from now may be different. Things may have changed. That's true, but, you know, there's never been a better time to demonstrate our prophetic capacity. Like, check this out. I'll bet that right now you're more frustrated with some of your Facebook friends than you've ever been. I'll bet that the social unrest related to the upcoming election has intensified in a way that you find hard to believe and you are maybe finally done with humanity and going to try living your life alongside another species. Yeah. Okay. So I wanted to start with all that because I've been observing just a fascinating thing about me and Stacy and human nature during the pandemic. And I came in the other evening and Stace was online. She's often online in the evening, either enjoying a show or catching up with friends or something like that. But I asked her what she was doing, and it began this, this wonderful sort of confession of how she's been spending or escaping the pandemic. So I have been spending a lot of time online, a lot of time just running away running away from the reality of my life that feels overwhelming and just not what I want it to be. So do you know how many times you can watch The Great British Bake Off? Turns out you can watch it a lot and then repeat it again. So I've been doing that, and I'm aware other times in my life that I escape, I run away, I soothe myself, comfort myself by that. But what I have been doing that's kind of new in the last month or so, is I am looking at houses in other states and now in other countries to to buy, to live in. I'm imagining this whole entire other life just because, well, because I want to run away. I want to run away from what has not been the life I imagined. And so I'm imagining someplace else, somewhere else, being someone else, and just running away so that life can be good again. Oh, yeah. I can identify because I want something in my life to be normal. And the thing that it seems like I have most direct control over is an old motorcycle in my garage. Actually, that's very true because just this morning I share a lawnmower with my neighbor and he was texting me going, do you know why the lawnmower is not working? Do you no. have any guesses what I should do? And it's just representative of everything is breaking. Nothing is normal. And I have this one effort, which is to get this old motorcycle running. And I've done everything and I've learned a lot. But the frustration level I was racing three days ago, just thinking, man, maybe it'll be today. and Maybe today's the day. Oh, I reassembled fuel lines, linked up Rebuilt again. carburetor, adjust the floats. Rebuilt carb, rewired motorcycle, rebuilt 
you know, throttle cable and flushed all fluids and on and on and on it goes. And I plug the, you know, the fuel intake back in and it won't, it won't drip fuel. It won't actually, you know, feed into the carburetors. And I just had this just throw my tools against the wall moment of frustration of, are you kidding me? It's down to the petcock. It's down to the thing that's supposed to drip fuel, and it's a little still tiny valve doesn't work. And I can only get them on eBay, and it has to ship from, and, and it's never going to come. Yeah, it's a frustrating experience. I just want life to be good again. That's been the discovery for me during the pandemic, and and it's come. You know, first off, I've had my own Amazon obsessions and confessions, buying little pieces of gear, obsessing over things for the yard, just something, some little purchase that's going to make me feel better about my life or make my life good again. And and then there was this wonderful moment. The, the other evening, I was coming back from work, parked my truck in the driveway. I'm walking up the driveway and the walkway in, we've got this little fountain that, you know, just kind of recircles and bubbles along. And next to this fountain is a beautiful wild rose bush, nearly wild rose bush. And it was blooming and the fountain was bubbling and it was evening. And there was just a moment where it reminded me of normal life. I just sat there. I I knelt down to just enjoy it. And I was aware of what I think is the fundamental longing of the human race. And that is, I just want life to be good again. Yes. And we all have our version of that. You know, maybe relational, maybe your health, it may be financial. It's just this, oftentimes it's this longing we can't even put words to, but a photo in a magazine will evoke it or a scene from a movie or a song from our teenage years that we hear again and oh there's just this yeah we want eden back we really do but i don't think we connect that i think for us the longing is just i just want life to be good again and it's that core longing that we've been actually trying to speak to in this series but i think so much of the language around it is actually in the way, you know, the return of Jesus, the end of the age. Oh, and let's just say, you can't say the return of Jesus without summoning up, you know, Albrecht Dürer and this kind of massive, bearded, thunderhead person coming to meet out justice. (laughs) It's a terrifying image. Uh, Well, yes, or, or... Oh, man, just, yeah, the phrase, the end of the age, I'm trying not to use it anymore because I don't think it's accurate. I don't, what we are hearing, what we are filling, you know, that's a box that we're filling with meaning as listeners. And it's, again, it sounds like loss. And so what I want to do here in the last episode in our series is I want to go back and get our bearings in the story for a moment. All the way back to sacred romance, what we've been trying to say is we live in a love story set in a world at war. And there is one story that the world is telling itself. There's one story in the scripture. There is a narrative God is telling it, that God is writing, that God is unfolding. So let's go back and get that and get our bearings and see if it'll help us to that beautiful longing in our hearts. I just want things to be good again. So beginning of the human moment in the story, in Genesis chapter one, God creates this absolutely gorgeous world. And he gives it to us almost like a birthday present or a wedding gift to Adam and Eve? Yes. It's, uh, like many things, it's a concept that we've gotten too used to, but God makes a world, a universe. It's such an astonishing thing to say. The beginning of the story is that 
out of the fellowship of the Trinity, out of this God who is Father and Son and Spirit, wild, very intimate, very passionate, wants there to be a universe with spiritual and physical dimensions and makes it? That is absolutely incredible. I mean, we get we get excited when we hear that an entrepreneur is going to renovate the Mexican restaurant at the end of the street. And that's good. We should be like, oh my gosh, he's going to do what? And then yeah. you hear the story and, hey, they've got this architect. And you go, oh my gosh, that guy's amazing. He has such a good eye. That's going to be a beautiful space. I can't wait to go in there. We should have some level of that enjoyment with like, God decided to make this and we were going to get to go there and explore it? What? Yes. Yes. And so all of the beautiful places that are dear to you. My, I remember visiting my grandfather's ranch after not having been there. He passed away. My grandmother passed away. You know, the story moved on. And I had not been back for my goodness, like 30 years to that part of Oregon and to drive back down those country roads and smell those alfalfa fields again. I mean, it just evoked for me childhood and joy and wonder and exploring the barns as a young boy and wandering the fields and catching frogs. Like We all have our Eden places. Yes. I just, one of mine which is very relevant to this conversation, doesn't really exist anymore, but it's a primal love with the American steppe, which the American grasslands are largely gone in terms of, you know, for various reasons. That part of creation has been occupied and transformed in some very amazing ways and in some super lame ways. But to go... Man, when I look at images of like the Chihuahuan grasslands, which is another odd thing that I just happen to really love, hey, there is just this like longing to be in them, yes. longing to to explore the waist high grass and the fields with mountains in the distance that now you can see in other parts of the world, but ours, can ours are add, so unique. Can we add horses running in those? Add some horses, add buffalo. Yes, yes. Everyone has these places. It might be, you know, the North Shore of Kauai. It's a cabin that your grandparents owned and that you went to. It's, you know, people love the beach. People love the mountains. People love fall. And and they have these wonderful memories of... People love the tundra. Yeah. People love the main freaking coast. Yeah. I mean, wow. So you have your special places, friends, and they are reminding you that God made a beautiful world for us as a gift. And then you have all those places that you long to see. So the human heart is made for this glorious world. So God God creates Eden, and he gives it to us. And he creates us as his partners in running this world. And all your gifts and all your desires to do and explore and accomplish and help and assist and overcome and discover, all that is is beautifully woven into and created for this world, this life that we find ourselves living. In episode one, we shared the Beautiful, heartbreaking confession of a of a dear friend talking about, but I haven't realized my calling yet in the world. I haven't haven't built those houses that that I wanted to build. I haven't, you know, made those films that I've wanted to make as a filmmaker. There's just so much yet. Like, yes, yes, yes. Find that place in your heart. That place is so core to the story of God. We were we were created to create. We were created to enjoy this world and explore it. Yeah, that is really an amazing point to linger on as well. Because you know, And we addressed this to a certain extent. And we said people have this feeling like they haven't done what they were made to do. And to start that at the beginning and go, yeah, 
that's that's more true than you know. And you were made to bring out the unrealized potential in creation that yes. wouldn't that no one would ever see if we didn't do it. Yes. Like the you know, God makes a creation that is the ultimate you know, rough sketch or the ultimate set of raw materials in a playful way to then go, no, you are made. You see something no one else sees. Uh, you carry part of heart, God's heart no one else carries. And you're made in the Genesis story to bring out things, to notice something that no one else would notice about Light for photography, education for children, gardening, architecture, architecture, yes. interior design, like whatever it is. Yes. And to actually bring it out in a challenging and dynamic collaboration. Okay. So recent confession is, you know, we have a couple of beloved golden retrievers and one is a year old, um, Coulter. He's our new one. And Coulter is here because we lost Oban a few years ago, and Maisie was by herself, and we're gone a lot during the day, and so we're like, we need to get her a playmate, so we got a, another golden retriever puppy. And, you know, people who say money can't buy happiness have just simply never bought a puppy. Like, yeah, I can't. Like, puppies are awesome. They're, they're just joy every morning. They're just so happy to see you. It's like, isn't this the greatest day ever? And... Well, Coulter, training Coulter has had its fits and starts. He he doesn't get fetch. He will fetch. He will run after the ball in the yard. He will grab it. He will wag his tail at you. And then while he's still 30 feet from you, he will drop it and kind of go, what's next? <laughs> and you're like, no, 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 Coulter, like watch Maisie. She brings the ball all the way back. But the desire, like the joy of animals and people's love of being with horses, people's longings to, you know, swim with dolphins, people's fascination with golden eagles and the Mongols who've been able to train them and still ride with them today. Like, it's amazing. Oh, yeah. The world of nature and our longing. It's wonderful that you can take a close look at anything and discover something pretty incredible. There are authors whose careers are built on this simple fact where they're like, look long and hard enough at a peanut, look long and hard enough. But here's a personal favorite one. There's a bit of a dilemma in physics uh, regarding bikes and why they work. And if you are a more technically minded person, it is, you know, we're talking about the interplay with animals, but talk about the interplay with the world itself and go... It is actually hard to describe why a person is able to ride a bike. And so when someone goes by you, there, there's just this incredible sense of wonder. If a cyclist goes by and you go, yep, doesn't really make sense. I mean, in elementary physics, it makes sense why that's possible. But if you actually begin to look at the forces in play, read a relevant encyclopedia page, go like, that shouldn't quite work. But And if it does... What else would actually work? What else is there that we just haven't tried or harnessed yet? You, you know, even if it's simple as no one thought a unicycle was possible, turns out people can ride those. And then you see the things that people figure out yes. that they can also ride, jump on, fly with. Yeah. It's, you know, yeah, it's the a big wave riders. And in the new trend there is the hydrofoil that that suddenly lifts them up off the wave and that lets them turn around and surf against the wave <laughs> back out into the ocean. That's the part that I don't get. Yeah, yeah. So here it is. God creates this absolutely gorgeous world, friends, and he creates it for us. And he gives us these deep hearts to enjoy that world, explore that world, develop that world, and all of that you see. And, and then the deep desire for family and friendship, and love, all of that. And then the story goes off the rails. Then humanity tries to do life without God. It feels a little bit like sugarcoating the problem. Like, 
Then humanity tries to take God's job, not just live apart from him, but push him off the throne of the universe and do it instead. Yes. Yeah, the great rebellion, the great fall, and all the heartache and all the injustice that has come into the world since then. Milton's line, our glory faded, faded so soon. I have a friend right now who has been involved, deeply involved in the um, human trafficking uh, justice movement for a long time. Front lines, I mean, dangerous, full-on heartbreaking. The, the, stories, the stories he sees every day are the kind of stories that we hear once or twice in our lifetime. And he is currently in a fight to rescue a, a girl and who's coming out of that. And there's a bunch of, of obstacles to it. And, you know, obviously, her own you know, traumatized soul, but the government, the, you know, the agencies you have to go through, all the legalities and the hoops in this, in this particular underdeveloped country. And as anyone who's tried to adopt you know, outside their nation can find it incredibly frustrating. You're like, all I'm trying to do is rescue someone for heaven's sakes, a child. How come you can't help me do this? And, you know, his long impassioned email to me uh, this week is beautiful and heartbreaking. And you just go, man, like, come on world. Like, you know, all that, all that is, is ushered into the story. Now, God intervenes. God intervenes through Jesus Christ. This is the great turn uh, of the Christian view of reality is that the incarnate God in Jesus of Nazareth comes to rescue the world he made. Yeah. I, we ought to ramp up a film score at this part to go. Yeah. Okay, wait, wait, wait. God begins to fight for the destiny of the universe. We may have talked about this other places, but it, like we do have to pause on the incarnation and run back to the Exodus story and go, the plagues of Egypt are God throwing down individually with the ranking demons on the earth. And he and it's an arm wrestling championship, and he goes up the chain of command. But to go before that moment, it was not clear in the story of the Bible that God was going to choose to fight for the universe. Yeah. And so, and, you know, we know because he was doing this thing on the side. But to go, whoa, the shockwave into creation when this guy rolls into town, who sent you? Uh, his name is I Am. And, you know, the Egyptians literally go, never heard of him. Who? Who is that? And then you go, oh, my gosh. Do you mean God is coming to fight for humanity? Yeah. And the story goes. And then finally, Jesus shows up. God fights for the destiny of the universe and for your life exactly. and comes. Exactly. Right, this is it. Overthrow Satan, rescue humanity, all of that. But here is where things get fuzzy for people. Even deep, deep friends of Jesus, because it, it feels like the next move, so yeah, 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 Jesus came, and yeah, 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 we're saved, and, and yeah, 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 he loves people, and we love people now, and forgive one another, you know, but it feels like the next move is some sort of massive wiping away of everything. You know, so when we get to, quote, the end of the age, the return of Jesus, the, the imagery starts getting so fuzzy or, or wrong, just, just purely, um, you know, we, we're moving to, everything gets wiped out and we move to a completely different story. It is what many people hold <laughs> yeah. to, right? Yes. Oh, it's just maddening. I, but you're doing this, but look at the narrative logic here. God creates a world. He makes humans with a destiny. They fall. He comes and saves them. And then in his last great act, he takes that destiny away from them. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I'm remembering this great dialogue in the legend of Bagger Vance where Bagger's talking to Juno, who's in a really bad place. 
Gina's got a really, really twisted worldview at this point because of his heartbreak, because of his losses, because of his alcoholism, all that. And, and Bagger says to Juna, so let me get this straight. He says, God gives human being all these wonderful things when he comes into this world. And the human being kind of messes all that up. And then at the end, God just takes all that away. And, and Juna goes, that's right. He says, you got a real hard view of life, Mr. Juna. <laughs> and then goes on to go, that's about the dumbest, <laughs> dumb thing I've ever heard. Like, but this is it. That, like, okay, so we feel like, okay, the next move is some kind of massive memory wipe. Um, everything that we love, every place, all the longings for family and career and meaning, all that, we move either to an entirely new story or we move into some new reality, you know, and all that, oh, it's just so unhelpful. And I haven't, I haven't touched one of the sacred, sacred things of, you know, the song, I Can Only Imagine. But the song, I Can Only Imagine, is mostly saying, I can't imagine. I don't know how wonderful it would be. And what we've been trying to say is, look, if you can't imagine it, you can't hope for it. Yes. And if it's so weird and so other, you actually don't desire it. And this is where we hit the ambivalence. This is where we are today. And we didn't get to talk about in an earlier episode, something you wanted to bring up was the effect in the last, you know, 30 years in the West, at least, of all the post-apocalyptic movies and stories, all the end-of-the-world movies. I mean, there's a jillion of them. Yeah. The effect of which we can summarize and go, we're finally going to lose. Yeah. And then that gets married to the concept of apocalypse because a, in quotes, post-apocalyptic film is always one in which the destructive impulses of humanity have finally pronounced themselves or the bell has rung over the world. Right. Well, one observation about post-apocalyptic movies is that they always look kind of just like regular human life somewhere. And so there is a bit of a, what happens exactly? Because that has already happened. Mm -hmm. Your vision of the future is a lot of people's present. But they go, yeah, uh, doom, violence. And there's two points to be made. One is that there's already plenty of doom and violence going on, so that looks normal. But it's humanity without hope. Yeah. It's humanity without Jesus. Yeah. And just to go, the incarnation is the assurance that the destructive impulses in humanity will never be the last word in humanity's story. Exactly. All the obsession with the, even the jokes around the zombie apocalypse and, and what's your zombie apocalypse plan and, you know, are you storing up food and ammunition and that sort of thing. Like, folks, that is not the story. That is not the story. God intervenes in Jesus Christ in order to put everything back in place so that we can pick up the story with the Eden that we lost. What it means for Jesus to return is not some sort of post-apocalyptic world or the blowing up of the world or the great memory wipe on humanity. I mean, so far from that, literally all of your longings for life simply, I just want life to be good again. Exactly. Precisely. Yes, but I haven't got my work done. Like, boy, do I identify with that. Wouldn't it be a relief to finally do the work that you were made for? I mean, we've hit this point again and again, but your calling was not made for a fallen world. Your calling was made for an unfallen world. And though that may be hard to grasp you know, in a moment, it is something that when you lay out the narrative, you actually have to accept propositionally. You accept it as reality and then push into it and ask to see how that will be true. But it is true. You were made with a destiny and your giftings for a world before it fell. 
it will be wonderful to solve the problems that fascinate you, to make something that didn't exist before with all of the resources of heaven and with none of the futility of human sin and the enemy's evil. Here's one of the classic stories. I was talking to a really good man a couple weeks ago and asking him a bit of his story. And the story was, he was an art student. He was gifted. It was his longing, uh, fine art, painter. But there wasn't money for that. And he came from a blue-collar family, and and there was a family farm. And, you know, Grandpa was a Navy guy who became a mechanic. And, and so he says, well, I guess, that's, I guess that's what I need to go do. I just need to go become, I need to join the Navy and become a mechanic like my grandfather. And with that way, I'll work with my hands. But he was describing to me the joy where his story was turning was 30 years later, just the last month, he has taken up painting again. He went on an outing with some friends and somebody brought a, you know, paint set, some sort of, you know, and he's like, oh my goodness, paints and a canvas again and a brush. And here you have this latent, beautiful gift in him that's suddenly reemerging, but he's also feeling the ticking clock, right? And to go, friends, there's no ticking clock. Think of it, all that latent gifting in you, all that that you want to do as cook, as gardener, as architect, as educator, as teacher, as philosopher, all that. Like, oh yes, that we get that back. The story is put back in place and we carry on in that realm. Yes. And just another example, I had a, you know, parenting thing the other week and was doing that thing where I was trying to think of who to talk to about it. And the person that came up was Craig McConnell. Mm. And I was like, man, I would, I, I think the perfect person to ask this question would be Craig, but then to go, and I will get to, and I will get to, to address this thing in my daughter's heart who will still need fathering, care, who will need direction in the course of her own maturity. And there is something in my collaboration with Craig that's unique to that problem that will be realized. Yes, yes. And all the injustices that we want to see set right, the world is crying out so loudly right now for justice and for things to be set right, for governments to act a Appropriately and yes, yeah. yes, exactly, friends. Uh, yes, it just makes me go. You could rightly replace the phrase "the final judgment" with "finally, comma, justice." Yes, yes. That the the heartache of friends again trying to adopt in foreign countries, and then those who have, and and then it's actually messier and and difficult and. You know, some of their hopes and dreams about what that would look like didn't pan out and go, it will, it will, justice will be beautiful. Governments will be wonderful at the return of Jesus. The love that you long for, the, the pain of separation that people go through in this world, it, just simply as, as time goes by. You know, parents age and grandparents move on and kids leave the nest. I mean, there's just that ache for family life to be good. Yes. The main point to say here over and over again is that your desires are not annulled in the return of Jesus. They actually begin to be fulfilled. And so your desire to be married the return of Jesus is not the death knell of your marital dream. It is, and we pushed into this in another episode, it is the beginning of the fulfillment of the very thing your heart longed for, which actually doesn't terminate in marriage, but grows up through it into the reality of intimacy, union, partnership, peership that you are after right now. Yes, that we will enjoy 
fully, really, with a world set right, not a world taken away from us and all of us sent somewhere else. The restoration that we long for in ourselves. Oh, my gosh. The restoration we long for in others. The longing for everything to be good again is exactly what the return of Jesus brings about. What we've also been trying to emphasize in this is that only the return of Jesus will bring this about. That there, there is just something stubborn, something that probably lingers from the Great Rebellion and the fall, something stubborn in human nature that kind of wants to get it done without God and doesn't want to rely on some vague future date called the return of Christ. And like, no, let's get at it now. I, I want this now. I want to come back to the centrality of the return of Jesus to setting the story right, how central that is in Scripture. Yes. And to the story that God is telling. And and if you don't mind, I'm going to read from a couple pages in a book that I wrote called All Things Mm -hmm. New. Whenever the church is wrestling to understand or recover some treasure of the faith, it's always a good idea to return to what Jesus himself had to say about the matter. After all, this is his story. It is his teaching on the Palingenesia that set us out on our wondrous journey here. Where exactly does Jesus want us to fix our future hopes? Quoting from the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. Or from the parable of the Minas in Luke 19, he said, A man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. From Matthew 24, Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. From Luke 12, be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet. Jesus clearly wanted us to interpret the story from the vantage point of his return. Now, heaven is very, very precious. Heaven is the paradise of God. But if you will notice, and I say this very reverently, very carefully, heaven is not the great anticipated event the writers of the New Testament look forward to. Paul in Philippians 3, and we are eagerly waiting for Jesus to return. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. Peter, In his second letter, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, Peter again in his first letter, therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. The great hope and expectation of the Christian faith is focused on one Dramatic, startling event, sudden as a bolt of lightning, the bodily return of Jesus Christ. And with that, the renewal of all things. The renewal of all things awaits the coming of our Lord, and the coming of our Lord ushers in the renewal of all things. The historic church held the return of Christ to be so central to the Christian faith that they felt it could not be put aside or buried as some peripheral doctrine without losing Christianity itself. And I'll end with this quote by C.S. Lewis, who wrote, There are many reasons why the modern Christian and even the modern theologian may hesitate to give to the doctrine of Christ's second coming that emphasis which was usually laid on it by our ancestors. And yet it seems to me impossible 
to retain in any recognizable form our belief in the divinity of Christ and the truth of the Christian revelation while abandoning or persistently neglecting the promised and threatened return. Quote, he shall come again to judge the quick and the dead, says the Apostles' Creed. Quote, this same Jesus, said the angels in Acts, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Quote, hereafter, said our Lord himself, by those words inviting crucifixion, you shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. And Lewis concludes by saying, if this is not an integral part of the faith once given to the saints, I do not know what is. So, in an attempt to summarize, friends, if you are associating some sort of loss with the return of Jesus, we can absolutely assure you, Scripture absolutely assures you, the heart of your God absolutely assures you, there will be no experience of loss. If you're associating some sort of disappointment with it, right? The marriage thing or the child thing or the career thing. It's like, we can guarantee you, friends, there will be no disappointment. Yes. If you are afraid of a new kind of reality or a new kind of existence, you don't have to be worried about that either. Jesus describes an existence of continuity, one that directly relates to this one, only resolved. Yes, the resurrection. Yes. Just look at Jesus on Easter morning. You go, oh, okay, same body, same guy, same personality. Oh, okay, it is the restoration of the current reality. So all of that, we don't need to be embarrassed by this doctrine. And I just, a quick thing on, I don't know why, but there are some very, very dear Christian leaders right now, good, solid people, theologians who are rushing during the pandemic to assure everyone, now hang on, hang on, you know, the world is not coming to an end. This isn't, you know, the return of Christ isn't just about to happen. And, and I want to go, what, why are you doing that? That's so totally unhelpful. Yes, no panic, but, but friends, we're actually told in Scripture to be ready that it's any moment, to hope that it's our moment. I mean, some generation is that generation. Exactly. Some hour is that hour. I know. The, the fact that the times are hard to read or you're told that you might not be reading the signs rightly doesn't relieve you of the burden and command to read the times and to be ready and to carefully consider your hour. And to keep your lamps burning, right? That what Christ does the, you know, go read Matthew 24 again, folks, and then read 25. Uh, because after, after he finishes the, you know, what we would kind of consider the apocalyptic discourse or whatever about nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and, and then the end will come, right? These are birth pangs, and then the end will come. Well, then he goes on to tell several parables of watch— and be ready. I want you to look for it. I want you to think your hour could be the hour. Like, let's not throw cold water on that for heaven's sakes. And, and as I mentioned in an earlier podcast back in the spring, one of the signs that Jesus gives in Matthew 24 is this gospel shall be preached. It's the last sign, actually. He says, at the end of that you know, discourse, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all nations, and then the end will come. Okay, so it seems to be tied to, and folks, like, there's agreement in the missional community that, that that's going to get done soon in this generation. So, like, why, why would heaven's name would people throw cold water on the hope and expectation when not only is it commanded that we set our hopes there and look for it and watch for it, but then an hour very much like this one sure could be it. Yes. And one of the reasons is, which I hope by now we've addressed, that people think 
if we believed this was the end of the age, we would act like crazy people and go on spending sprees and refuse to pay our taxes or whatever it is and go, no. When you believe that Jesus is coming soon, you will finally be sane. You will be Prince Rillian when the enchantment lifts in the evening, and you will know some basic things just about how to live your normal yes. anticipatory life. Yes, forgiveness will be so much easier for you. You will be so you'll just be so ready to absolve everyone of everything. It will be so much less embarrassing to talk about Jesus coming because or Jesus period because there will be a sense of, well, he will soon tell you himself. Yeah. So, it's not on me to tell you right now, but I have less than nothing to lose by saying his name. Yes, yes. And then the freedom to love and to live like we've always wanted to live, it actually sets you free to be a Christian and to act like one. I had a fascinating thing I wanted to share here at the end as we try and wrap up this series. I was I was thinking about the end of The Lord of the Rings and how poignant it is like it is resolution but it isn't and the resolution is so costly you know frodo leaves his his wound is too great he he the elves leave i know it's so heartbreaking they're already leaving at the beginning of the book right it's you know his frodo's first meeting with them in the woods is a band of elves leaving and and they're abandoning middle earth all the magic all the wonder leaves middle earth Gandalf leaves. Frodo has to leave because, because of his wound. And yes, Sam is married and he's going to start a family. And yeah, But it's so poignant. And what I want to point out, friends, that's actually not a good view of the story. It isn't the Grey Havens. Tolkien was not trying to write a novel that would illustrate for us the restoration of all things. If he were, it would go like this. When the king returns and is crowned in Minas Tirith, some sort of shockwave of healing and light begins to just ripple out like waves across the world. Yes, the elves return from the Grey Havens <laughs> yes. and out of the past, Elbereth and Gilthoniel rise up again. Yes. There's word that their ship is on its way. The men of Westerness come and rebuild the ancient ruins just like Isaiah prophesied. Frodo does not leave. Frodo is well. Right. There is a great party. And in the background of the party, suddenly the, and the lost Entwives appear and they're participating, and there's the reunion of yes. long separated tree beard and yes, I think Quickbeam is the name of his ent girl. Yes, right. It is life is good again. Life is good again. That longing in the human heart that's had you obsessing over when you can travel or trying to, you know get out of the current job into a new one, get off Zoom, for heaven's sakes. Just that longing for life to be good again, that is the most precious longing of the human heart. That is the central longing addressed by Scripture. That is the very thing that happens at the return of Jesus. Life is good again. And that's why we've taken five episodes to try and get at this. That's why we spent so much time trying to address these ambivalences. And for one last reason, I do believe that the friends of Jesus crying out for his return in moments of joy, in moments of heartache, in moments of earnest worship and prayer, I think that's part of what Revelation shows. That, you know, At the end of the scriptural story, the friends of Jesus are crying out, Come, 
Lord Jesus. Quickly. Come quickly. The Spirit and the Bride say, come. Amen. <laughs>